Сначала МКС, потом орбита Луны, потом Луна, потом жизнь покажет. 70 метров, скорость 0,47. Мишень в центре ВСК. Ребята, по той телеметрии, которую мы получаем, у нас замечаний нет. Так что все нормально. У нас тоже все в порядке по данным корабля. Движение плавное, мишень практически в центре. Есть включение со СВП. Состояние транспарантов штатное, штанга выдвинута. Защелки выдвинуты. Крюки открыты. Наблюдаем станцию. Отчетливо видим на экране. Мишень в центре, кресты собраны. 20 метров, 0,13. База АР. Сейчас вас немного покачали по крену. Хорошо. Мишень практически в центре, кресты собраны. Стыковочный узел чистый. 2 метра, 0,12. Есть подвод. Есть механ соединения. Контакт снят, расходимся. Есть работа ДПО. Скорость расхождения увеличивается. Принято. Уходим от станции вниз. Включайте РВ. Не забывайте давать данные по высоте и скорости. Продублируйте нам телеметрию. На ту в баках ТДУ. Понял. Какая луна красивая под нами. Нас вызывает база Богуславский. Переключаюсь. Добрый путь! Добро пожаловать в учебный класс. Hello. We'll continue our lessons now. Today's topic is Soviet and Russian space exploration. But first, your homework. Let's review. How did space exploration begin? Masha, are you ready? Good afternoon. I'm ready. Excellent. Please bring your presentation up on the screen. The vast expanse of space contains a countless number of worlds. Stars, planets, asteroids, comets, clouds of dust, and gas. We live on an amazing planet, which we call Earth. People have long dreamed about other worlds, about the possibility of living, traveling, and working outside Earth. But how to ascend into the boundless sky?
Dreamers invented various fantastic devices for flight into space. But it turned out that neither wings nor even a huge cannon could overcome the powerful force of Earth's gravity. And then, people started thinking about rockets. Konstantin Eduardovich Tsiolkovsky in Russia, followed by Hermann Julius Oberth in Germany and Robert Hutchings Goddard in the United States, came to the idea of the practical possibility of using rockets for space flight. In the Soviet Union, Tsiolkovsky's scientific and science fiction books about space flights, multi-stage rockets, orbital stations, spacesuits, and weightlessness became popular in the 1920s and 1930s. Friedrich Arturovich Sander and other enthusiasts of interplanetary travel, inspired by the scientists' work, began creating the first rockets, still not for space, but using unconventional liquid fuel. In the 1940s, rockets began to be widely used in military affairs. In Germany, during the Great Patriotic War, the V-2 combat rockets were produced, which the Nazis used to bombard cities in Great Britain. Whereas in the Soviet Union, rocket projectiles, which soldiers called katyushas, were created. This rocket weaponry played a significant role in the victory over Nazi Germany. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union began creating new, powerful military rockets. The work on Soviet rockets was headed by the remarkable Soviet designer Sergei Pavlovich Karolyov. He made an enormous contribution to the development of world space exploration. Under his leadership, all the first victories of the Soviet Union in space were achieved. Sergei Pavlovich gathered a whole cohort of glorious Soviet scientists. The theory of rocket flight was developed under the leadership of academician Mstislav Keldish. He was unofficially called the chief theorist of cosmonautics. Teams of talented Soviet engineers were led by chief designer of launch complexes Vladimir Barmin, Chief Designer of Rocket Engines, Valentin Glushko. Chief Designer of Control Systems, Nikolai Pilyugin. Chief Designer of Radio Communication Systems, Mikhail Vyazansky. Chief Designer of Telemetry Systems, Alexei Bogomolov. Chief Designer of Gyroscopic Systems, Viktor Kuznetsov. Designer of Engines for Spaceships and Stations, Alexei Isayev. This list, of course, is incomplete. Sergei, please continue. In 1957, the unique International Scientific Program International Geophysical Year began. For the first time, scientists from many countries around the world carried out joint comprehensive studies of our planet and near-Earth space. It was announced that preparations were underway for the launch of the first artificial Earth satellites. Few doubted that the first satellite would be from America, but things turned out differently. In August 1957, in the Soviet Union, the first successful test of an intercontinental ballistic missile, the R-7, took place in history. Soviet engineers created a new original design. The rocket was launched at the new Turatam range in Kazakhstan, the future Baikonur Cosmodrome, and reached Kamchatka. At that time, it was the most powerful rocket in the world. The unique design allowed for the simultaneous launch of the four first stage side block engines and the engine in the central block of the second stage. An unprecedented power was achieved, 20 million horsepower. Masha. Would you like to add anything? I read that at a ceremonial meeting dedicated to the centenary of Konstantin Eduardovich Tsiolkovsky's birth, the creator of the new rocket, Sergei Korolev, said, In the near future, for scientific purposes, the USSR and the USA will conduct the first trial launches of artificial Earth satellites. Good. Sergei, please continue. 
Late on the evening of October 4, 1957, the two-stage R-7 rocket, for the first time in history, achieved the first cosmetic velocity and launched an artificial satellite into Earth's orbit. This was an unprecedented achievement of Soviet science and technology. Thus began the space age for humanity. Later, other countries joined in space research. Outstanding achievements belonged to the United States of America. Unique missions were accomplished by countries in Europe, China, Japan, Korea, and others. The number of participants in space activities grew rapidly. Thank you. So that is how the space age began. In today's lesson, we won't be able to show the entire grand history of world cosmonautics. That would take far too much time. Instead, I'm going to talk about the main achievements in the exploration of space where the Soviet Union and its successor Russia were pioneers. And so, I begin. Just a month after the launch of the first satellite, the second was sent into space. It weighed an entire half ton. On board, it not only had the first scientific instruments, but also a cabin with a dog. And in May 1958, the third Soviet artificial Earth satellite was launched. Its mass was over 1,300 kilograms, and it was equipped with 12 scientific instruments. It was the first real scientific laboratory in space. In March 1962, the Soviet Union launched the first satellite of the Cosmos series. In just the first 60 years of implementing this grand program, more than two and a half thousand different devices under this name were put into orbit. Satellites carry out scientific research, provide communication, internet, television, navigation, meteorological observations, remote sensing of the Earth, optical and radio-electronic reconnaissance. Scientific experiments are also conducted. A striking example of a Soviet scientific satellite is the Proton, launched in 1968, weighing 17 tons. It was intended for the study of cosmic particles of high and ultra-high energies. This unique satellite remained the record holder in many parameters for many years. Today, numerous space apparatuses from different countries around the world work in the interests of humanity. And it all started with the launches of the first Soviet satellites. And all of this thanks to our rocket. That's absolutely right. The unique Soviet R-7 rocket turned out to be one of the best in the world in its class. Imagine. In its modern modifications, it still flies successfully today. In January 1959, equipped with a third stage, it was the first in history to reach the second cosmic velocity. The automatic interplanetary station Luna 1 overcame Earth's gravity, passed near the moon, and entered in orbit around the sun. In Soviet newspapers, it was called the first artificial planet. Well, yes, of course. For a planet, this device is rather small. But it was the first to move around the sun like a planet, and it still flies to this day. After several unsuccessful attempts, on September 14, 1959, the Soviet automatic station Luna 2 reached the moon. It fell near the large craters Aristilus, Archimedes, and Autolycus. Here, where humanity first touched the moon, lie small metal pennants with a commemorative inscription among the lunar rocks. How cool! Is it far from here? Quite far. 
Now there's a monument there. I think we'll make a visit there. Hooray! During the first ever flight of a spacecraft to the moon, the then leader of our country, Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, was visiting the United States. He presented American President Dwight Eisenhower with an exact replica of the Soviet pennant delivered to the moon. It was a symbol that our country was confidently ahead of America in space. In October 1959, the next Soviet automatic station, Luna 3, for the first time obtained images of the far side of the moon, which is never visible to Earth observers. The pictures were not very high quality, but they were the first. On the first map of the full surface of the moon, names proposed by the discoverers, Soviet scientists, appeared. A large, dark area on the far side of the moon was named the Sea of Moscow, and one large crater was named after Tsiolkovsky. Will we also fly there? No. Our program doesn't include that. Let's not get distracted. The first soft landing on the moon was also achieved by the Soviet Union, although solving this complex task was not immediate. At the beginning of 1966, the automatic station Luna 9 transmitted the first ever image from the lunar surface. And the first artificial lunar satellite was the Soviet device Luna 10. From its board, the melody of the Communist Party anthem, the Internationale, was broadcast live. Well, that was the custom at the time. In the tense moon race with America, the Soviet Union was the first to orbit the moon and return a descent craft to Earth, flying at the second cosmic velocity more than 11 kilometers per second. This highly complex technical task was first solved by the Zond-5 apparatus. It was launched using the new powerful Soviet Proton rocket in the autumn of 1968. The rocket was created under the leadership of the outstanding Soviet designer, Vladimir Nikolaevich Chilome. The descent craft of Zond 5 successfully splashed down in the Indian Ocean. The first living beings in history to orbit the moon turned out to be two turtles. So the first lunar astronauts were Russian turtles? Yes. There were also seeds of various plants and fruit flies on board. The Soviet Union planned to send two cosmonauts around the moon in a similar ship, but this project was never realized. But Soviet engineers managed to bring samples of lunar soil back to Earth with an automatic device. Under the leadership of Georgi Nikolaevich Babakin at the Design Bureau, the E-8 landing platform was created. The rocket installed on it with the return craft brought 100 grams of lunar rock to Earth. This unique experiment carried out by the automatic station Luna 16 was later repeated twice more. Well done, Masha. And what happened next? In November 1970, the same type of landing platform from the Luna 17 station delivered the world's first remotely controlled rover, Luna Hod 1, to the moon. Three years later, its younger brother, Luna Hod 2, set a record, 
It traveled 37 kilometers over the moon in four months. And of course, our first lunar hut also worked admirably. In 300 days, it covered 10 and a half kilometers across the lunar wilderness, leaving the tracks of its eight wheels in the moon dust for millions of years. It transmitted over 20,000 images and more than 200 panoramas of the lunar surface back to Earth. The achievements of the Soviet automatic lunar stations were only replicated by China 50 years later. Correct. But the moon wasn't the only target of Soviet scientists. In February 1961, the Soviet Union sent the world's first interplanetary station towards the planet Venus. A record for long distance radio communication was registered, more than two million kilometers. Soviet interplanetary stations set a series of records. Venera 3 became the world's first spacecraft to make a flight to a distant planet. There, as well as to the moon, a commemorative pennant was delivered. Venera stations 4, 5, and 6 were the first to perform direct measurements of the chemical composition, pressure, and temperature of the gas during descent on parachutes in the dense atmosphere of Venus. While the spacecraft Venera 7 and Venera 8 were the first to transmit information from the scorching surface of the planet. Soviet automatic stations of the new generation became the heaviest in the world. Their mass reached almost five tons. Descent craft of the new series first transmitted black and white and then color images from the surface of Venus. No one managed to replicate this achievement for many decades. Soviet interplanetary stations Vega also carried out the most sophisticated scientific program. In addition to delivering the world's first aerostats with radio transmitters and new descent craft to Venus, the stations set off to intercept Halley's Comet and transmitted to Earth images of its nucleus from a close distance. And what about Mars? The first spacecraft sent from Earth to the Red Planet was Mars One in 1962, and the first ever parachute descent as well as soft landing on Mars was carried out by the Soviet Mars Three. The Soviet Union also made a major contribution to manned spaceflight. Under the leadership of Sergei Pavlovich Karolyov, the first spacecraft in human history, Vostok, capable of taking a person into space, was created. The spacecraft underwent complex testing. First, several satellite ships of similar design were launched, preparing for the future flight of a cosmonaut. On one of these ships, the famous dogs Belka and Strelka were the first in the world to fly into space and safely return to Earth. Oh, we know about those dogs! On April 12, 1961, the world's first human spaceflight took place. Soviet pilot cosmonaut Major Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin on the spacecraft Vostok made one orbit around the Earth and safely landed.
Большая река, видно хорошо там острова. Вот тут увидели горизонт. Звезды, просто они немножко четче на этом черном фоне, такие светящиеся точки. Очень красивый горизонт. Видно такой нежный-нежный ореол вокруг Земли. It was the Soviet Union that managed to realize humanity's centuries-old dream. Город ликовал. Вы знаете, я такое видел только тогда, когда видел своими глазами еще мальчишкой 9 мая, День Победы. Праздновалась вся страна. Вот то же самое я видел тогда. И это было здорово, понимаете? Four months later, cosmonaut German Titov carried out a day-long flight on Vostok 2, making 17 orbits around the Earth. This was a time when each new flight of Soviet cosmonauts became a world achievement. In 1962, with an interval of one day, two new spacecraft, Vostok 3 and Vostok 4, were launched. They were accurately placed into close orbits, and cosmonauts Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich saw each other's ships through the portholes. The joint flight lasted about two days, and a year later, two Soviet ships were launched again in succession, and again, unique results were achieved. On Vostok 5, Valery Bukovsky made a five-day flight. His record for the duration of a solo space flight was unsurpassed for many decades. And on board Vostok 6, Valentina Tereshkova went into space. The first woman in space. Yes. Her flight, like Yuri Gagarin's, will forever enter the annals of human history. Like Gagarin, Valentina Tereshkova became a true citizen of the world. She traveled a lot, meeting people in different countries. She headed the Union of Soviet Societies for Friendship with Foreign Countries. The return to Earth of cosmonauts who flew on Vostok spacecraft was not a simple matter. At an altitude of seven kilometers, the cosmonaut ejected from the spacecraft along with the seat as in a military aircraft and landed on their own parachute. That's amazing! When soft landing engines were developed for the spacecraft, the need for the cumbersome ejection system was eliminated. Then, space was freed up in the cabin for an entire crew. The first ever flight of the Soviet Voskhod spacecraft with three cosmonauts on board took place in 1964. Vladimir Komarov, Konstantin Fyoktistov, and Boris Yegorov made a day-long flight. For the first time in orbit, there were not only military pilots. Fyoktistov was a space engineer, and Yegorov was the first doctor in space. The flight of the next Soviet spacecraft Voshod 2, like Yuri Gagarin's flight, will forever remain in history. Alexei Leonov, in a spacesuit, exited into open space, while the spacecraft's commander, Pavel Belyaev, waited for his comrade in the cabin, ready to assist if necessary. The next stage of manned flights was associated with the creation of the most mass-produced and successful manned spacecraft in the history of cosmonautics, the Soyuz spacecraft. Unfortunately, during the first test flight, Soviet cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov died due to a parachute system failure. Later, due to the depressurization of Soyuz 11 during its return to Earth, three more cosmonauts died. Georgi Dabravolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev. Humanity remembers them, as well as the 17 astronauts who perished during the disasters of American space shuttles in flight and on the ground. They are all true heroes. But the Soyuz spacecraft 
learn to fly and continue to be successfully used to this day. They have many achievements to their credit, including those that were world firsts. In 1968, two unmanned Soyuz spacecraft achieved docking in orbit. The following year, cosmonauts did the same, performing docking manually. After docking, cosmonauts Alexei Yeliseev, Yevgeny Khrunov, donned spacesuits and opened the hatches of the living compartments and moved through the open space from Soyuz 5 to Soyuz 4. Their commanders, Vladimir Shatolov and Boris Valinov, controlled this operation from within the non-depressurized descent modules of their ships. This exercise practiced transferring to the landing module for a future Soviet lunar mission. Unfortunately, Soviet cosmonauts never flew to the moon. A unique experiment was conducted on Soviet ships, which has not been repeated to this day. Within two days, three Soyuz spacecraft numbers 6, 7, and 8 were launched. Seven cosmonauts were in space at the same time. On Soyuz 6, experimental welding work was carried out for the first time and Soyuz 9 set the flight duration record. Andrian Nikolaev and Vitaly Sevastyanov worked on board the spacecraft for 18 days. In 1971, the Soviet Union opened the era of long-term orbital stations. The world's first long-term orbital station, Salyut, was sent into orbit. Its crew worked there for an entire month for the first time. The Soviet Union was ahead of the United States by two full years. Important missions were also carried out by the first ever manned military orbital stations Almaz, equipped with reconnaissance equipment. They entered history under the names Salyut 3 and Salyut 5. Soviet stations were launched one after another. The first ever orbital station, Salyut 6, with two docking nodes for the first time, provided continuous long-term presence of crews in orbit. Soyuz spacecraft delivered cosmonauts to the station while Progress cargo ships brought fuel, water, air, food, and equipment. People learn to live and work in space for extended periods. For the first time in the world, international crews flew on Soviet spacecraft. The first representatives of 26 countries from Europe, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa ascended to space aboard Soviet and later Russian spacecraft. This was a remarkable experience in strengthening friendship and good neighborly international cooperation in near-Earth orbits. The first representative from Eastern Europe in space was Vladimir Remek from Czechoslovakia, and the astronaut from Western Europe was Jean-Louis Chrétien from France. The first Asian cosmonauts were Pham Thuan from Vietnam, Jugdir Dimadin Gorakcha from Mongolia, and Rakesh Sharma from India. The first Latin American astronaut to venture into space was Arnaldo Tamayo Mendez from Cuba. And the first cosmonaut from the Middle East was Mohamed Faris from Syria. All of them worked in space using Soviet technology. The first spacewalk by a woman 
was performed by Svetlana Savitskaya, who worked on the Salyut 7 station. Well, the pinnacle of Soviet manned spaceflight was the famous orbital station, Mir. It operated in orbit for 15 years, hosting more than 100 cosmonauts and astronauts from various countries. That's absolutely right. The Mir station continued to operate even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Its operation was taken over by the successor of the USSR, the Russian Federation. On Mir, an absolute record for the duration of a spaceflight was set. Russian cosmonaut Valery Polyakov worked on board for 437 consecutive days. This was a magnificent achievement. At the end of the Soviet Union's history, a unique rocket and space complex was created. Under the leadership of Chief Designer Valentin Petrovich Glushko, the Super Heavy Energia rocket was developed. And in the team led by Gleb Yevgenievich Lozano Lozinski, the orbital spacecraft Buran was designed. In several parameters, Buran surpassed the American shuttle system. But alas, the Energia Buran project ceased to exist along with the country where it was created. Yes, it's very sad. Yes, it is very sad. But the colossal experience accumulated by Soviet and Russian engineers during the operation of the Salyut and Mir orbital stations became in demand in the new project of the International Space Station. The United States, in collaboration with the Russian Federation, the European Space Agency, Japan and Canada have successfully worked aboard the ISS for many years. As before, new modern modifications of the hard-working Soyuz reliably brought international and Russian crews here and returned them to Earth. Russia has maintained the space traditions of the Soviet Union. Modern satellites operate successfully and Russian cosmonauts continuously work in space. Few countries possess their own manned flight technologies, and Russia is one of these countries. Launches continue from the Russian Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and the Plesetsk Cosmodrome in the Arhangelsk region. Our modern Vostochny Cosmodrome is also developing. Russia has a great space past, so we confidently look to the future. In Russia, as before, new rockets and spacecraft are being created and launched into the sky. Our country made the first steps of humanity into space. And this fact will forever remain in human memory. There will never be a last Russian flight. Ahead are new grand accomplishments. Russia's history in space continues. что все-таки, наверное, как велико то, что нас объединяет на Земле, и как ничтожно то, что нас разъединяет. Вот это чувство, которое не покидает во время полета.